So let's focus a little bit on the kind of the players in the market who from a clinical um, clinical health care, let's say, uh, who, who are you seeing as far as maybe type of entity, not necessarily names of particular entity? Who are you seeing as the most active players in the clinical space as far as transactions, uh, M&A? Uh, and again, I'll throw it op- open to the to the panel. Happy to jump in first. I think in, in clinical M&A, as much as we've had a really slow M&A market for the past two years, it's been the one forefront of healthcare that hasn't slowed down, right? So a lot of clinical M&A is based on inorganic growth and growing throughout on acquisitions uh, and realizing some gains in that end. So that's what's really been keeping the healthcare M&A market afloat while the rotation has been outside of technology. So I've seen activity really across the board, you know, behavioral health, ambulatory, just traditional clinical services. Uh, that's where a lot of the volume has been that we've been seeing for two years now. Yeah, I'll maybe jump in. We, so we have a $7 billion portfolio of physician practice management businesses, uh, includes women's health, fertility, uh, gastroenterology, orthopedics, oral surgery. Um, for a long time, the roll-up strategy was was very interesting to a lot of private equity investors. Um, you saw that in dental, probably first, urgent care. Um, at interest rates where they are, it makes it very hard for those strategies to actually uh, be very productive from an add-on perspective. And you are seeing organic growth kind of slow. It's still low to mid-single digits, maybe GDP plus, while you know, the theme we've talked about, labor inflation, has also impacted those businesses. So I say you know, this year in particular, you've seen a, a, a lower uh, volume of those types of opportunities in the market. Maybe a couple of orthopedic platforms have come, um, some more nascent roll-up strategies, but it's hard to make the math work because the platform multiples, although they've come down some, the add-on multiples for smaller opportunities have actually stayed kind of in line, which makes that, that roll-up strategy very challenging. And so we've actually been prioritizing our, our new investment activity in HCIT and pharma services, life sciences, away from those provider businesses, you know, for that reason. And then maybe just one other comment is just in terms of reimbursement and, and costs, you know, for next year, you know, the, the expectation is costs are going up 5 to 9%. And reimbursement's going to continue to be pressured. And so value-based care, which one I'm sure we'll get into over the course of the panel, is becoming, you know, more and more important as the quality of healthcare and the outcomes you're providing, you know, are, are more, um, you know, in focus. Mm-hmm. The one thing I'd add to what Jonathan said, Chris, is the tectonic plates that are shifting in healthcare right now are right in the bullseye of the question you asked around clinical M&A. And the most important um, uh, change uh, and a real historic change here is the acquisition of primary care physician groups by health insurers. Um, mm-hmm. United Health Group is the, the largest owner of primary care physician groups, their Optum division, CVS mm-hmm. and Walgreens both made splashes. So this vertical integration of the supply chain connecting uh, primary care with the insurer or with the retailer is a big shift. At the same time, hospital systems have been acquiring specialists in, in record numbers. So this creates a really interesting dynamic for those health insurers that can't afford to acquire primary care physician groups. We see them going digital through trying to create better digital front doors to provide primary care to their members through digital platforms because they can't afford the storefronts that the CVSs and the Walgreens or the Optums are buying into on the primary care side. Do you think that's a long term that that'll end up kind of replacing the storefront? Uh, Are you... I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I enjoy having a, a CVS on every corner sure. and there's convenience to stepping in um, to get um, things right away. Yeah. But, um, you know, clearly Amazon has a, uh, has a plan that they're, that they're executing on. So what, 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 what I think is really clear about the future, there's a lot, a lot of stories still to be written. There's a lot of unknowns. What's really clear is that digital um, engagement with members is replacing more and more of the in-person. COVID was an accelerant. Yep. It allowed to break through a lot of the regulations that were barriers to- Yeah, there's been a little bit of a pullback though. It, Agreed? It, exactly. I think the the physicians have very strong lobbies sure. and, and uh, disrupting their business model is not- you know. And I've never been sure that the payers are sold on it either. I've talked to a lot of payer folks as I work in that and I'm not sure that they're sold on the value proposition of it from a cost standpoint, but we'll see. Well, 
those that don't invest in, in digital will be disintermediated by those who can and do. Sure. Um, I, I, you know, any health plan, plan member would like the option to be able to get their care digitally, to have a chat or a video or a phone call with a, with a doctor and have that be reimbursed. So I, I think that's the way the world is going. Yep. Question is going to be how much they reimburse for whether it's, you know, the same level or, or not. But Mike. Yeah, I just go back to what Jonathan uh, was describing in terms of physician practice management, and I'd extrapolate that to health system M and A. Um, the last five, ten years, we're all about scale. Um, healthcare, people say it's a two trillion, three trillion, going to three trillion dollar uh, part of the market. I often think about it as hundreds, if not thousands, of billion or two billion dollar markets. It is still highly, highly fragmented and typically very local. And what Blackstone and other private equity firms have done has said, look at this. You know, from a scale perspective. We need efficiency through scale. Let's start acquiring and be a serial acquirer to get that scale. And that's worked pretty effectively for a lot of private equity firms to a point, right? At a certain point, scale is hard to manage. Um, you need to start ripping out technology. If you've got three different vendors, you're choosing one that takes years to do. That's where we are in the, I'd say, health system and uh, physician part of the market. But that's where, if you start, as you start, start talking about AI, ML, technologies, that's really where the efficiency in terms of workforce efficiency and scale take hold. You need large, sophisticated organizations to actually have the throughput mentality in terms of using technology and really investing in it. If you're a two-doc group in New Jersey, you're not going to be spending money on AI. If you're 40 docs, maybe. If you're 100 docs, probably, right? And so that's where we are in the, in the life cycle of the market. Uh, and to Charles's point, five years from now, if you're not using that and you're 100 docs, no one's going to want to go to you, right? Um, I think where we're seeing AI, and, and we can get into this a bit, is as those physicians start to use technology, they don't really want to change their workflow, right? They just, it, they've been doing things the way they've been doing things. They see the technology coming. But if it's helpful, so one of the big parts of where we're seeing it right now, for example, is, uh, and we talked about it, they talked about it a bit in the, in the first panel, actually, interestingly, is automating uh, clinical notes. So when you go to a physician, a physician's typing into an EMR. They've been doing the last 10 to 20 years. And, and by the way, they, we needed that money and funding from the government and also scale for those EMRs to be implemented. But now if you're a physician, you're typing into a note to one, document and get reimbursed, two, talk to the care team, and three, talk to the patient. You're also sitting in front of a patient trying to listen to that person, right? It's almost impossible. Where AI can come in, in my mind is, and what we're starting to see is automating that next step. So Say you go to a, a physician, you have a 30-minute visit. Um, certain companies right now are basically automating that clinical note, which is unstructured text. And you get a text message in two seconds, basically saying, "This is what was happened. This, ha this is what happened in your visit. This is what the follow-up is. Here are the next steps, and here are the action items." Physicians actually not doing that. That's actually through AI. So it's a, one case study, for example, in terms of how you need scale for one, right, where you have a large organization who's actually purchasing this. You need the the um, autonomy from a physician perspective to actually do what you're doing, but in a way where you don't want to change your behavior and the technology is doing it for you, all of those things start to come together. So that's I just a lot going on in that uh, conversation. But as you think about healthcare, you know, large economy, large part of the market, how do you start inf you know, influencing, influencing embedding technology into it? You need a lot of things to come together with scale.